Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and this is my overview of the Nikon 1 series cameras. I'm using a J5, but the other Nikon 1 series cameras, like the V series cameras, they're very, very similar. The buttons and dials will be in a little bit different places. Some might have a few extra features, but for the most part, all the main functionality is going to be the same. If you have a different camera, or you want to send your friends to uh, find a tutorial that's similar for their camera, visit sdp.io slash tutorials. There we have tutorials for just about all popular cameras that are currently available today. I'm not going to cover every aspect of this camera. I'm not going to cover things like how to apply the weird tilt shift effect to your camera or weird black and white effects. I, I encourage you to have fun with that stuff, but I'm going to stick to the aspects of it that are core to getting great pictures and really core fundamental photography stuff. So let's start by going over the physical controls of the camera. First of all, you probably managed to get the camera assembled, <laughs> but just in case you didn't, I'll show you where the uh, battery memory card are. If, if you already know some of this and you want to skip forward, check the description of this video. You'll find a table of links that allow you to jump forward to any part of the video that's relevant to, including things like lens and flash recommendations that you'll find at the end of the video. Flip open this little door at the bottom here, and you'll see if you hit that yellow switch, the battery can come out. You'll, you'll want to align the battery with most of the writing on the back. So where it says Nikon and the arrow, that'll go towards the front of the camera. And just push that in until it clicks like that. Next to it is the memory card, and this is your digital film. It takes micro SD memory cards, which are very small and easy to lose, also difficult to pull out. You can see just how tiny that is. I have a little 32 gigabyte memory card in there, um, but I actually recommend getting a 64 gigabyte micro SD card. They're pretty inexpensive. This one's like 22 bucks here. You can pick it up at sdp.io slash msd. And those 64 gigs should, should allow you to shoot for roughly forever, <laughs> depending on how many pictures you take. So you'll put that back in just by pushing it in until it clicks and stays in place. Now, if you want to transfer your pictures from your memory card to your computer, there are a few different ways you could do it. You could take that memory card out and put it into a memory card reader. You might have to use the little adapter that comes with the memory card and put it into a regular SD card slot. You could also use the USB opening over here and the USB cable that came with your camera or another USB cable that fits in there. They're all pretty compatible. Plug it in there and then plug the other end into your computer. Then you could load the, your pictures into whatever your favorite image processing app was. A third way is to use this camera's wireless capabilities. If you want to do your editing on something other than a computer, like your phone or a tablet, you will definitely be using those Wi-Fi capabilities, and I'll talk about those in just a little bit. At the front of the camera, there's a button right here to the, uh, on the left side of the camera as you're holding it. Push that in, and then you can twist this lens clockwise, and the lens will come off. This reveals the camera's sensor right here, and the back of the lens, you can see the contacts on there. What you're going to do to put it back on is to look for the white dot on the lens. Where is it? There, this is marked right here on this lens, and then the, the white dot on the mount there. You'll line those up and then twist it counterclockwise until it clicks. And then I always wiggle it back and forth a little just to make sure it doesn't accidentally <laughs> fall off or anything. You can turn the camera on by holding the on switch like this until the little green light comes on. And then often, depending on the lens, the lens will kind of power up. To zoom, you'll twist the ring on this particular kit lens, but other lenses might work differently. So you can see as I twist it, it's zooming in and out. Um, you can activate the flash with this button on the side here. Push that. The flash pops up. Cute little guy. And um, the one last thing that I want to show you is the HDMI port. This is something I never ever use. But under this door here, there's a micro HDMI port. You can get a micro HDMI to HDMI cable and then hook that up to a TV or a monitor if you wanted to play back your pictures full screen. And I, I just don't ever use this, but if you were on vacation, you could put on a slideshow for your family by taking a micro HDMI to HDMI cable, plug it into the TV, and then you could play back your pictures on the full screen. But nowadays, most people prefer to just grab the camera and look at the pictures on the back of the camera. One of the first things people go to buy is uh, like a case. And I, I don't recommend using this camera with a case. It, it's fine if you want to do that. But I find keeping it inside a case means you're less likely to use it. Just because you have that extra like 10 seconds, 20 seconds that it takes to get out of your bag, you'll miss some moments or maybe you'll just choose not 
to take a picture when you could. What I recommend instead is just getting a little strap like this. This is a wrist strap that I like. You can see a link to it here, sdp.io slash harness. But any little wrist strap will work. It just hooks right on here. And I find this is my favorite way to carry a small camera like this. I just carry it like this, and it's always on my wrist, and I can just grab it whenever I want because the strap is so small, it never really gets in the way. Let's talk about actually taking a picture. It's really easy. When, when you have the camera on, hold that down until the camera comes on. You'll be able to use the display on the back, and then just push this shutter button up here halfway down, and it will focus. You'll see green lights, and you might hear a beep. Push it all the way down, and it takes a picture. It'll then automatically replay the picture for you. Maybe an even easier way to take a picture is just to touch the screen with your finger. This does two things. It tells, you, tells the camera where exactly it should focus, and it takes the picture. So if you're taking a portrait of somebody, you would want to touch right where their eye was so that it focused right on their eye and took the picture. It's a lot easier than any other way of trying to select a focusing point, and it happens pretty much instantaneously. It's my favorite way to take a picture. You can review pictures really easily too, which is a great idea. We call it chimping. You look at the picture after you're done just to make sure that it turned out well. There's a play button just to the upper left of the directional pad here. So push that and you'll see the last picture that you took. Let's scroll back a little. I have some other pictures that I took. Oh, look, here's a picture from my kid's birthday party. You can easily scroll, zoom in by just pulling, just, just like you do on your smartphone. And then you can zoom around a little bit. It's a great way to make sure that your pictures are sharp. You can, of course, zoom back in like this. And um, if you keep pushing it, you'll see you'll be able to view thumbnails, and that will allow you to quickly scroll through lots of pictures. You can zoom back even further. That way, if you want to go back a few days and find a picture that you took, it's really easy to find something. You can view different information about the picture. You can see it's showing when the picture was taken and some details about the picture. So now I'll give some general tips for taking different types of pictures, starting with landscape pictures or just general travel photography. It's, it's really easy. You can just leave the camera in the green mode here, and your landscape pictures will probably be fine. If you get more serious about it, you might want to switch into program mode or aperture priority mode, which we'll discuss in a little bit. But for things like landscapes, your camera's automatic settings will probably be just fine, and they'll give you just absolutely great results. For sports photography, this camera has a special mode. It's the little running guy. The universal symbol of sports photography is that little running guy. So select that, and your camera will put itself in a mode where it can pretty intelligently track moving subjects and take lots of pictures. Now, this is not as effective as a big sports camera, a big proper DSLR at sports. However, if you're shooting fairly wide angle, if you're not super zoomed in and people aren't moving too fast, or if you're looking at them from the side, rather than having them running directly towards you or away from you, the camera's probably gonna do just fine. So just keep those things in mind. Don't push the camera too hard and you should be able to get some great sports shots out of it. If you'd like to get into wildlife photography, well, it's, this probably isn't the right camera for wildlife photography. You can get a fairly big telephoto zoom, but it's gonna be really challenging for you to get great results out of it. Instead, you might wanna check out a tutorial that I have, scp.io slash which camera will take you to that tutorial. And it gives you some some options for wildlife photography that might be even less expensive than trying to get different lenses for this camera, less expensive and more effective. If you're into night photography, this camera is really well equipped for that. You can put the camera into manual mode or just use automatic mode, but manual mode usually works better once you get comfortable with the settings. And for detailed instructions on, on taking night pictures, go to stp.io slash NP or check out chapter 10 in my book, Stunning Digital Photography, which I'll talk about in just a sec, too. First, let's talk about aperture priority. And as a person who's experienced with camera settings, aperture priority is the mode I leave the camera in most of the time. To select aperture priority, take the mode dial here and mark it at A. A stands for aperture. The aperture is the opening in the lens that controls how much light comes in. And the way we tell, the way we uh, name the different size openings is really confusing. We use what's called f-stops. So on the left, you can see a wide opening, we might call it f2, a low number. A small opening, we use high numbers like f32. And that, that seems counterintuitive. After all, you would think a big number would mean a big opening, but in fact, it works just opposite. But if you remember fractions from school, think about it like a fraction. You see how it's written f slash 
32. That 32 is actually in the denominator of it. So in that case, because it's in the denominator, a big number might actually mean a small opening. In a nutshell, what you need to remember is high f-stop number will give you a high background sharpness. That means both your foreground subject and distant details in the background will be nice and sharp. A low f-stop number, like f5.6, will blur the background more. So low background, low f-stop number, low background sharpness. Now, on these cameras, it's not something you necessarily have to worry about blurring the background or not. For the most part, you can always use the lowest f-stop number. You'll have plenty of, of what we call depth of field, which means your subject and the stuff in the background will be plenty sharp, and uh, you should get good image quality results. It'll be a little bit different if you start to use some of the other lenses, um, like the f1.2 lens that they have. For more information about f-stops, go to sdp.io slash f-stop. I have a whole tutorial there, or check out chapter four on my book, Stunning Digital Photography. I do want to show you these sample pictures to show you the effect that choosing different f-stops in aperture priority mode can have. On the left here, you see a picture of my bride with the background really blown out. There, I'm using a bigger camera, but a camera with a lens set at f1.8. In the middle, I increase the f-stop number to f8, and you can see the background becomes much, much sharper. And in the rightmost picture, I have it at f22, and you can see the background is really sharp. You can kind of practice this in your mind while you're watching TV or a movie. At each scene, look at your foreground subject and then look at the background and kind of notice, is the background sharp or is it really, really blurred? And you'll start to appreciate that filmmakers will use these different f-stops to get different looks. And photographers too will use these. For example, portraits are often shot with a low f-stop number to blur the background. And for that reason, you might even select a different lens to be able to go to a lower f-stop number and get more of that background blur. I'll, I'll talk about some different lenses you can use in just a little bit. The lens that comes with your camera, it's probably marked f3.5 to f5.6. Those are moderate f-stop numbers. That means you won't get a huge amount of background blur at any setting. But if you search my channel for a video called How to Blur the Background, I'll give you some tips on how you can get good black background blur. To control the f-stop number, use the main dial here on the back, right on the directional pad. And you can see the camera showing me the f-stop number right over here. Right now it's at f5.6. If I move it to the right, I can go all the way up to f16. So this lens on the front is indicated f3.5 to f5.6. But the camera is not letting me select anything below f5.6. And that's because of where I'm zoomed. This is a 10 to 30 millimeter lens, and I'm zoomed all the way in at 30 millimeters now, which means the minimum f-stop number is actually f5.6. So if I were to zoom it back to 10 millimeters, the widest angle setting, now if I move the main dial, I can pull it down all the way to f3.5. It's what we call a variable aperture zoom. So as you zoom, the minimum f-stop number also changes. Not a big deal. Most of the time you can just shoot at the lowest f-stop number regardless of where you're zoomed. Another mode I like is shutter priority mode. Shutter priority mode is indicated by an S on the mode dial here. So I'll click over to that. This gives you direct control over the shutter and the camera sets everything else for you automatically. Shutter priority is useful for controlling just how long the shutter is open. So when you take a picture, you might think that it captures an instant in time, but it's not really true. It's always a period of some amount of time. Sometimes it might be one one thousandth of a second, which is enough to freeze a water droplet in motion. Other times, it might be one-tenth of a second, one-sixtieth of a second. These are much longer periods of time. And over the course of one-tenth of a second, me talking, if, if you took a picture at one-tenth, you would see my mouth blurred because my mouth is moving faster than one-tenth of a second. But if you took a picture of me at one one-thousandth of a second, I would be completely frozen. So shutter, figuring out the right shutter speed can be difficult. You might just think, why not? You always shoot at one one-thousandth of a second to freeze all motion. And the reason is that's not giving your camera very much light because the shutter is only open for an instant. And what will happen is that will result in very noisy images. So you always want to use basically the slowest shutter speed that you can while eliminating handshake caused by holding the camera and eliminating motion blur caused by your subject's movement. To figure out what shutter speed you should be using, check out sdp.io slash settings, a whole video where I kind of go in depth into it. But in general, 
in, in low light environments, taking pictures of your family, your kids, try starting an in shutter priority and then using a shutter speed of 1 30th of a second. That's a good starting point. So I'll move this main dial here on top and I'll scroll it until I get to 1 30th. You can see it down here in the lower left corner. Now 1 30th, if you take pictures of your family or kids, sometimes there's going to be a little bit of movement. You might catch them just as they're turning their head. So because of that, you should always take a couple of pictures at a time. Don't ever just take one picture. Get four or five pictures and you'll improve your chances of not just getting a sharp picture, but getting a picture where they have just a great expression because people's expressions change in instance. It's, it's really easy in the digital era to take lots of pictures and delete most of them. And that's a great way and an easy way to improve the overall picture quality. It's not like the film days where you, if you took five pictures, you had to pay a whole bunch of those five pictures. So don't hesitate to take lots of pictures. Just don't share lots of pictures. Delete all the ones except for the very best one. If you're taking pictures in, uh, of, of like kids' sports, a really common task, for, for little kids, you might be okay at 1 1 25th, though you'll probably be happier at 1 2 50th of a second. If you're taking pictures of bigger kids, like middle school and high school sports, you might have to go up to 1 500th of a second, or even faster. A good rule of thumb is to take a few pictures and then zoom in. If everything is crisp and sharp, you might even try going with a slower shutter speed to give your camera more light. If you see a little bit of movement in there, increase your shutter speed, maybe double the shutter speed, and try it again. So you might go from 1 1 25th of a second to 1 2 50th of a second until you get to that point when you're happy with the sharpness of your pictures. Again, check out that URL for a more in-depth discussion on how to choose the right camera settings. This illustration shows three different shutter speeds and the effects that they might give. You know those like spinny things in playgrounds? I'm with my daughter when she was younger. And at one eighth of a second, you can see the background is completely blurred. I'm sitting on it too, so we're both spinning at the same pace. She's nice and sharp, but the background is blurred. At one thirtieth of a second, you can see it's much less blurry. That's because the shutter's not open for nearly as long. And at one one twenty fifth of a second, you can see the background is basically completely frozen. We're moving at the same pace the entire time. This just shows that higher shutter speeds can help to freeze motion while you're taking a picture. So it's something to think about as you're choosing your camera settings. Manual mode gives you control over both the aperture and the shutter speed at the same time. So aperture priority mode lets you control the f-stop and lets the camera choose the shutter speed. Shutter priority mode lets the uh, camera choose the aperture or the f-stop and lets you choose the shutter speed. And manual mode gives you control over both. So I'll take the mode dial here and move it over to M. That's for manual mode. And now the dial up here still controls the shutter speed. You can see that's changing as I move it. And the dial in the back still controls the aperture. Now you'll notice that even though I'm changing these settings, the exposure on the picture really isn't changing. It's staying the same brightness. And that's because the camera by default is set to use auto ISO. Auto I ISO controls the brightness of the picture. And even though I'm in manual mode, the camera is still setting that for me automatically. So my exposure is, is going to be locked in unless I go to one extreme or the other where the camera can't fix it for me. Like if I choose an extremely fast shutter speed or an extremely high f-stop. Manual mode is, is you, something you might never have to use. Only more serious photographers will ever need to really understand manual mode. However, if you feel like you're getting serious and you want to understand it, go check out the tutorial here, sdp.io slash go manual or read chapter four in sending digital photography, and that'll help you um, choose all the right settings. Now, if you get into night photography, like not even night in the city, but night in, er in rural environments where there might not even be moonlight, you might have to use a very long shutter speed, even over 30 seconds. By default, this camera will go up to 30 seconds. Um, this camera does have bulb mode. So the way you can activate bulb mode is to put the camera into manual mode, and then using the shutter speed dial up here, scroll it to the left until you get all the way down past, uh, past one full second. That's one second. I'll keep going left two seconds. And as I go, I go, I get to 30 seconds eventually. And this is the, the maximum, the slowest shutter speed this camera supports. If I go one more click to the left, I get to bulb mode. What bulb mode does is it keeps the shutter open for as long as I hold my finger down on the shutter button here. So if I press it and release it, 
the shutter speed will be however long I held my finger down. If you're taking pictures at night, this can be useful if you need to take an exposure of two or three minutes. So as I'm holding it down now, the camera's taking a picture this whole time. It's not going to be a good picture because <laughs> it's pretty bright in here and my hands are moving all over the place. So anytime you'd use bulb mode, you'd also be using a tripod. Now, there's a real problem with using bulb mode on this camera in that, to the best of my knowledge, there's no remote trigger that will lock the shutter open. So to use bulb mode, you would literally have to stand there with your finger on the camera. And that means you'd, you'd certainly shake the camera because you are human and you probably have like blood flowing through your veins and stuff. And that would move the camera enough that it would ruin your picture. So I'm going to provide an alternative that doesn't require you to buy a remote shutter release, even if you could. Go to stp.io slash filter. There I have a video that, that tells you how to work around using different types of filters, including what we call neutral density filters. You won't need a neutral density filter. I'm just going to use this as an example of a technique on how to get long shutter speeds when you need them. So if you're trying to figure out how to take a two minute exposure and bulb mode isn't working for you for this camera, what you should do instead is take four 30 second exposures and then use the technique I described in that video called image averaging to combine those four 30 second exposures into one two minute exposure. It's, it's not as hard as you might think, and it can be done with free software. I, I wish I had an easier alternative, but this is the best I've been able to come, come up with for this particular camera. Now, in this tutorial, I'm teaching how to use your camera's controls, but that's really not the most important part of photography. Photography is all about capturing the moment, the expression. It's about composition and lighting. Photography is more art than science. If you're interested in learning that art, if you're interested in getting really great pictures and not just sharp pictures, check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography, over on the left there. The ebook version of it that you can read on your phone or a tablet or your PC is under 10 bucks. There's also a paperback version, which is around 20 bucks or so, sometimes less. You can pick it up at sdp.io slash store with worldwide shipping or go to Amazon. You can order it from them. Check out all the reviews. There's like 1,500 reviews now. And people really like the book. If you get into post-processing, I have books on Lightroom and Photoshop, uh, also available at the same links. And if you just want to know more about camera gear, check out my camera photography buying guide. If you absolutely hate books, well, don't worry, because all these books include uh, over 12 hours of video each. So you can just watch the 12 hours of video and never read the book. Or you could read the book and never watch the video. But for best results, read the book and watch the video. It's a fantastic way to learn. And they include many other online resources that can, can help you really get the most out of photography and have the most fun with photography. If you just want straight video training, I have that too, a video training guide. You can get it at that same link. Now let's talk about the different shutter modes. By default, when you first get your camera, it'll take one picture at a time. You'll push the shutter button halfway down, it'll take that one picture, and that's it. If you want to take multiple pictures at a time, a technique that's really, really useful, you can change the shutter mode by pushing the directional pad to the right. If you look really closely, you can see what looks like a, a stack of papers, kind of. That's the international symbol for shutter mode for some reason. So if I click that left, you can see a couple of different options here. I can select the second option, which shows 10 currently. If I scroll to the right, you can see I can select how many frames per second I want the camera to capture. So if I select 10 frames a second, as I take pictures, it will actually be capturing 10 frames a second. And uh, I, I had my finger held down on the shutter there and it took like 20 pictures. I actually find 10 frames a second to be a little, a little too fast for me. Um, but you could go all the way up to 60 frames a second if you wanted to, which is something you'd only do for capturing extreme action where there was a whole lot of movement. Um, so 10 frames a second is generally a good option. You can hold the shutter button down for, you know, half a second or a second and get a couple of different frames. And then when you go back to review them, if somebody blinks in the picture, which happens all the time, you won't have to worry about it because you'll certainly have one frame where everybody's eyes are open. Now, if you do select continuous shutter, uh, you should know that the camera will not allow you to select a shutter speed slower than 1 60th of a second. So even if I go into shutter, shutter priority mode, if I scroll, try to scroll left, you can see it's stuck at 1 60th of a second. I can go faster, but I can't ever go slower than 1 60th. So if you're seeing that you can't go slower than that, go ahead and switch back to single frame mode, and now you'll be able to select 
slower shutter speeds. On that same setting is the self-timer. The self-timer is, is good for two different things. First, it's good for taking that self-portrait, you know, where you put the camera on a tripod and then you, you run around and you put your arm around your family and everybody smiles and you get that picture. The other thing it's good for is steadying the camera to eliminate any camera shake. If you have the camera on a tripod and you push that shutter button, you'll actually shake the camera just a tiny amount. And for things like night photography where the shutter is open for a while, that can visibly shake the picture. So you can use the self-timer to delay the picture by two seconds so that after you push the, the button, the camera has a chance to steady itself and give you a nice sharp picture. So to change the, to set the self-timer here, push it to the right on the directional pad. You see that there's a little symbol of a clock there. Oh, it's so small on this camera, but I'll push that. And now I can go down to this third option, self-timer. And if I scroll to the right, you'll see I can choose between two seconds, which is good for steadying the camera, and 10 seconds, which is good for running around to put your arm around your family. So if I set it to 10 seconds and I push the shutter button, you can see there's a timer right here that's counting down, and you'll see the green light on the front that blinks just to let you know when to smile. So if you watch it, there it goes solid, and then it takes the picture. After you've done that, hit that shutter button again and go back to single frame mode just to make sure that you don't leave it in that mode because it can be really annoying if you're uh, going to take a picture and you still happen to have the timer on. This camera has a few different focusing modes. So by default, it's in what it's, what's called AFA, automatic mode, where it will figure out if you're taking a picture of a still subject or a moving subject. You can manually control that. The way I'll do that is by pushing up on the directional pad. I'll push it up there, and it brings up this control screen. And so now you can see over on the lower left here where it says AFA, if I touch that, I can select between AFA, which is the automatic mode, AFS, which is uh, for focusing on a single subject that's holding still, AFC, which is for tracking a moving subject, or manual focus mode. At the end there, MF. You can use manual focus mode on this camera, though I find it to be kind of cumbersome. If you do decide to use manual focus mode, push the OK button in the middle of the directional pad there, and it will zoom in. Now, you can use this dial to control the focus. So you can see now the screen there is blurry. I can dial it to the left until it gets nice and sharp. But this camera has a great focusing system. You shouldn't often need to manually focus. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off again by pushing up here, touching the MF, and then switching back to AFA for automatic mode. For more information about when to use different focusing modes, and how to get the best results when focusing on a moving subject, go to sdp.io slash focus. It's just a free video. ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. You can control the ISO in your camera by doing the same thing, basically. First, starting out by pushing up on the directional pad there. That brings up this menu. And then just type, tap the ISO setting here. And now you can see I can scroll up or down to choose different ISO settings. Now, by default, it's set to automatic ISO with a maximum ISO of 6400. That's what A6400 means. You'll probably never need to change that. That setting should work all the time. If you decide, if you get into my book maybe, and you decide you wanna control the ISO, that's what you would do to set it. You can see it has a, the camera has a base ISO of 160. That'll give you the cleanest images, but with potentially longer shutter speeds. Or you can manually set the ISO to anything up to 12,800. Those two settings at the bottom, which are labeled NR6400 and NR12800, those have some extra noise reduction built in. And what that means is those pictures will have less noise, they'll be cleaner, but they'll be a little bit less sharp. So you have that kind of trade off there. But again, I pretty much always use auto ISO. The only times I don't use auto ISO with a camera like this are when I'm taking pictures at night because the, the metering system tends to underexpose things. So I might wanna control the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO all together. Now let's talk about exposure compensation. Sometimes you take a picture and it's either too bright or too dark. Your camera is supposed to figure that out for you automatically, but it's not always perfect, especially if a person is backlit. If they have the sun behind them or the bright sky behind them, their face might be underexposed. If you go and you take a picture out in bright white snow, the snow will probably end up looking kind of gray. You can control that by setting the exposure compensation on your camera. So to do that, you'll grab the directional pad there, and if you look on the right there, you can see 
the little plus minus symbol. That's the international symbol for exposure compensation. So as I push that, this slider comes up here. And now I can scroll to the right to make everything really bright up to three stops brighter. Or I can scroll to the left to make everything much darker. And this is kind of done to taste. <laughs> if you're shooting in the snow, you want to just dial it up, maybe a stop or 1.3 stops until the snow looks nice and bright, but not, and not at the point where it's solid white. That would be overexposed a little bit. And if you ruin a shot, if you don't completely nail it, don't worry. You can go back later and uh, fix it on your computer, especially if you're shooting raw, which you usually can. Oh, for, for more information about using exposure compensation, including when to use it, watch the free video I have at stp.io slash ec. This camera includes a, a pretty good Wi-Fi feature, which is great for transferring pictures from your camera over to your phone. That way you can quickly share them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it is you want to do, it makes social networking much easier. You can also use the Wi-Fi app to take pictures with the camera. I'll just show you how to use it really quickly. The first thing you'll want to do is to go into the store and install the Nikon wireless mobile utility. It should be a completely free utility, so don't pay for anything. At that point, if you happen to have an Android phone that has NFC capabilities, you can connect the phone and the camera with NFC. If you look on the, the grip here, you see this kind of N symbol, and that's the NFC symbol. Now, what you'll have to do, is, this is supposed to make things easier, but it's not that easy. You'll have to rub the part of NFC part of your smartphone against the NFC part of the camera. And I can never remember. There it is. So the NFC worked because I rubbed the right parts of them together. And it says um, end current Wi-Fi connection and connect to the selected camera. So even if you have NFC, your phone and your camera are always going to communicate with Wi-Fi, which means if you're currently connected to a Wi-Fi connection, you'll have to turn that off and you might not be able to get to the internet. So I'll click yes here. And now it's automatically, the two are talking. You can see it says waiting for Wi-Fi connection. This is getting it set up and connecting to the camera. There we go. I can see it's connected now. And there we go. So there we can see my empty cup of tea displaying in real time. This allows me to just take a picture by pushing the button down here. You really can't change the settings and stuff, but you don't necessarily need to you can change the, the brightness. This actually happens a lot. So you can see a problem has been detected. Check the camera and the wireless mobile adapter. I find the connection to be kind of unreliable, so it will kind of flake out. It will simply not work sometimes. It disconnected from the Wi-Fi network and then just reconnected. And, and good luck with it. <laughs> it can just be a little bit flaky. You can also use the View photo, Photos button here to transfer pictures from your camera to your smartphone. So I'll pick pictures on camera here. Now you can see it's downloading the information. So it does take a second to transfer. It's going to get a thumbnail from every picture. And well, it's not speedy. <laughs> So you can see all the, the pictures from the camera, and I had it in continuous mode there. It took an awful lot of pictures. Let's scroll down a little bit further. Okay, so here we can see pictures of the birthday party. So with that picture selected, I can click download there. It will confirm that I want to download it. And then I can pick the size, either the full or original resolution, the recommended size, which is something lower resolution. I Just go ahead and pick original, and then click OK. And now it's going to download that picture from the camera to my phone. So I'll tap OK there. And now that that's on my camera, what I can do is I can go into the sharing app. So I could open up Instagram. I don't know why. Of all the pictures that pop up, it has to be a picture of the naked cowboy. And as I go to share a photo, you can see there's the, the picture for me to share. So once it's onto your camera, you can just use your regular app to share it. Now, I showed you how to connect using NFC in an Android phone. If you have an iPhone, and you probably do, the process is going to be a little bit different. What you'll do instead is, on the camera, let's get it out of this mode. You'll push the Wi-Fi button here, and that will activate Wi-Fi. Now you can see the camera says, waiting for the Wi-Fi connection. What you'll do at this point is to go into your camera, and open up your Wi-Fi settings. 
And so like the Wi-Fi network that's written on the back of the screen here starts with Nikon. So I'll just select that and connect to it. By default, it doesn't require any kind of encryption, and that's probably okay unless you want to make sure some hacker doesn't jump onto your network while you're transferring and, and reads your pictures, but for sharing it anyway, you might not care. So now that it's connected, once I can see the Wi-Fi is connected, now I can go in and actually launch the Nikon app and go through the process that I just showed you. You can do that on Android phone too. If the NFC isn't working, just go ahead and manually connect by joining the Wi-Fi network. When you're done, if you want to get back onto the internet, you'll probably need to go in and disconnect from the, uh, the network on your phone, or you could just turn the, the camera off to disconnect it, because if your phone's connected to your camera, it won't be able to reach the internet. It'll try to get to the internet through your camera. I, I feel like I should know that we, we tried to piece together a decent tutorial on how to use the Wi-Fi, but it failed multiple times during the course of the recording. So I, I find that the Wi-Fi on just about all modern cameras is a little bit flaky because it's this combination of an extremely complex camera and an extremely complex smartphone app and wireless networking, which can be a little bit flaky. So you have like multiple levels of flaky. Things frequently go wrong. It can be a lot of trouble. If you find yourself frustrated with it, you might just resort to connecting your camera to your computer with a USB cable and copying the pictures over that way. But for occasional sharing, it's not too bad. Now, there's two types of pictures your camera can take. They're file formats, basically, either RAW or JPEG. And pretty much all the pictures you see online are JPEG pictures. And if you do any sharing with your camera, you'll be sharing a JPEG file. However, this camera is capable of taking RAW pictures, which have significantly better quality. They tend to be a lot cleaner. And if you make a mistake, like if you overexpose or underexpose a picture, you can more easily fix it on your computer. Believe it or not, you can completely overexpose a picture and restore it so that it looks perfectly good. So if you're thinking about shooting RAW and you want to understand the differences, check out my tutorial here, scp.io slash raw v jpeg. That will kind of show you the ins and the outs and what that actually means. It's, it's actually really easy and it has huge benefits. However, it can slow down your picture taking just a little bit. To switch between RAW and JPEG, hit the menu button to the right here and then make sure you have the, the second tab on the left selected. Right now it shows an A because I'm in aperture priority mode. If I were in shutter priority mode, it would show an S. So it'll say something different, but it, it'll be the second one. And then the very second item down says image quality. So I'll select that by scrolling to the right and you can see I can select the default of JPEG fine, or I could switch to raw files. I could also choose to record both raw and JPEG files. So I'll set that to raw files, which will record bigger files that might need some processing on the computer, but that will produce higher quality images that will allow me to fix minor errors. Let's talk about the different metering modes. The metering mode is how your camera looks at a scene and decides how bright or dark it should be. You will never have to change the metering mode, but you might want to. If you're reading chapter three in stunning digital photography, I'll talk about the benefits and disadvantages of different modes. If you decide that, you're, that you wanna change yours, I'll push up on the directional pad here. And then you can see in the bottom center there, that's the metering mode. So I'll select that and I can choose between the, the matrix metering, which is the default and the best, the center weighted or the spot metering. Again, matrix metering should do the trick for you almost all the time. I just wanted to show you where those were in case you get into the book and you start to understand that you might want to use something, a different setting for a different mode. This camera has a flash built into it. You can activate the flash by pushing the button on the left here. You can't really control the flash. So if you are working through some of my other material and you learn about flash exposure compensation, that won't apply to this camera. You just kind of have to accept the, the default amount of output but the flash is a good way to help illuminate low light conditions. Now, I personally hate the flash, hate any kind of on-camera flash, not just this camera in particular, because it tends to blind people and it washes people out. So for me, I'd rather just use auto ISO and deal with the repercussions of uh, using a higher ISO, in other words, a higher sensitivity to light. I find that the extra noise in the image generally looks better than adding that extra flash. But of course, I'll leave that up to you. If you want to change the white balance, this is another setting that's totally optional. You might never need to change it, but you can change the white balance by hitting the up arrow here on the directional pad. And then in the bottom right corner, touch that and select the light source that matches your current light source. So you can see as I'm switching between these, 
the, the purpose of white balance kind of becomes clear. I'm under daylight balance studio lights here, so they look just like the sun. And so if I select the sun, you can see the white looks pretty white. But if I were to select incandescent, suddenly the white looks very blue. And that's because, in reality, incandescent lights, like old-fashioned light bulbs, are very yellow. And if I select fluorescent here, everything becomes a little bit purple. And that's because fluorescent lights actually have a little bit of a green tint to them. Your camera can notice this difference, but your eye, well, your brain, actually accommodates for it automatically. So if you're under incandescent lights, those yellow lights will look white to you. That's because your brain kind of has an auto white balance feature. It's, it's fixing this weird aspect of light that we generally don't even notice. Your camera has auto white balance too, and it will generally fix it for you just fine. But sometimes it doesn't nail it. Or you might want to change the white balance for a special effect. So if you get into it, that's the way that you would do it. I'll switch it back to auto because it's always a good idea to change a setting back once you're done changing it. If you shoot raw, just know that you can always change the white balance later. Therefore, you don't have to worry about it at the time you're shooting. You can fix it later. You can easily record video at any time by pushing the record button up here underneath in the middle of the main dial. So as I push that, it will just start recording video. And that's about all you really need to know. You can just record and shoot and you can zoom while you're shooting. Um, if you get more into it, there are some other settings you can change. First, it does have a dedicated video mode on the mode dial here. So I can just switch it over to the video camera thing. And that changes a couple of aspects of, of how the camera works, but it's all pretty self-explanatory. If you hit the menu button, you can see there are a few settings related to recording video. Most of these you don't need to worry about, but I'll go down to frame size slash frame rate and then scroll to the right. And here you can see the default is 1080p at 30 frames a second. And that's standard HD, and it should look great. But you could also record 1080p at 60 frames a second. And what that does is give you a much smoother effect if you're watching it on something like YouTube, which can play back 60 frames a second video. That will also allow you to, in editing later, to slow things down up to two times and have it look really smooth. So for me, I always shoot at 60 frames a second just because I love the effect. If you haven't seen what 60 frames a second looks like, look up some 60 frames per second videos on YouTube and you'll just see that there's something much more lifelike about it. That's about the only setting I really recommend changing. If you're in a different shooting mode like program mode or shutter priority mode, you have another option which is for to enable electronic vibration reduction. So I'll hit the menu button and then if I scroll down far enough with the mode selected, you'll see electronic VR for movies. If I scroll to the right here, I can turn this on. And what this does is it adds another level of stabilization where as we're shooting video here, you see these crop marks? Let me increase the exposure. See these crop marks on the corners there? That is the por portion of the frame that's actually gonna be recorded when you have electronic VR on. And what that will do is the camera will kind of move the sensor around a little bit to steady it. So you can see with electronic VR on, the shake of my hand is completely invisible. My hand looks completely steady. Even though it's not, I am human. It's just that the camera is counteracting all of that movement. So electronic VR is a useful feature to use when you're hand holding it. Just know that it's gonna crop it down a little bit according to those crop marks. Now let's talk about how to format a memory card. If you get a big memory card like I recommended, you might never have to format the memory card in the lifetime of the camera. You might be able to take thousands and thousands of pictures and never fill it up. But if you do fill up your memory card, copy those pictures to your computer, and then you can format the memory card and reuse it. It's like reusable film. To format the memory card, hit the menu button here, scroll to the left and go down to the wrench icon, and then the very second option, format memory card. Select that, it'll prompt you to confirm, Select yes and then click OK. Now, once you do that, it's gonna erase all the pictures on your memory card so that you can write them again. So make sure you have the pictures backed up to your computer and you have those pictures backed up somewhere else like to a cloud backup service. Google that phrase, cloud backup service, if you're not sure. If you accidentally format a memory card, all is not lost. You can probably get your pictures back if you stop using the memory card. There's a free tool called PhotoRec that you can get at this URL here, stp.io slash photorec, that will scan your memory card and recover the pictures. When you look for a tool to recover pictures, you will find lots of tools that charge you, but you don't need them. 
This tool is easy to use and completely free. In fact, most of those tools you pay for are just that free tool, repurposed. So don't pay for anything, you can get it for free. Now, you'll notice that your camera has probably been making lots of beeping sounds while mine is not. The reason is that that beeping drives me insane. It would drive you crazy too, especially if you're a wedding photographer and, you know, the church is really quiet and this is beautiful moment. And then what you hear is you hear Uncle Bob in the background going, <laughs> sounds are so annoying and you don't need them. You'll know when you're taking pictures, you'll know when the camera is focused. So I recommend turning sound off to save the sanity of people like me. Hit the menu button with the wrench icon selected here on the left, scroll down to sound settings and then scroll to the right. Now you can scroll to the right to turn on or off any of these different sound settings. So turn them all off. <laughs> you might want to leave the self timer on. That can be useful so you know when the camera's ready to take a picture. And then you can see if you just go back, it will forget the settings. You need to click OK because it says down here, set OK. So I'll click OK and then it will remember the settings for me. And those of us who hate the beeps will appreciate it. Now I'm going to recommend some software tools some different lenses and, and other accessories that can make your photography much more powerful. The first is a completely free tool called Picasa. It will allow you to organize your pictures, it will copy them from your camera, process raw files into JPEG files for you, allow you to make easy adjustments, and then easily share them. And it's free. At least it's free and it exists at the moment. You can pick it up from sdp.io slash DL Picasa. Unfortunately, Google's announced that they're no longer going to be updating Picasa, so you should still be able to get the existing version, and it should work fine. But sometime in the future, the app probably won't be supported anymore, and it might not work forever. But for now, it's the very best thing available. I also strongly recommend getting a second backup battery for this camera, because the battery doesn't last forever. And when you're at home, just like shooting around the house, it should be fine. But if you go on vacation, and you want to go out for a full day of shooting, you're going to run out of batteries at some point and you'll need the second battery. So go to this link, sdp.io slash el24 and pick up a second battery. You can find generic non-Nikon batteries. And I, I will recommend generic things when you can, when you can use them successfully, but the generic batteries tend to die really, really quickly. Um, like they'll work great for a period of maybe six weeks or two months. But then after that, the battery life falls off really quickly. They might die after only a few pictures, and that can really leave you stuck. You might be out for a day of great picture taking only to find that the generic battery dies. Anyway, for that reason, I recommend actually using the name brand Nikon batteries and carrying an extra one with you when you're traveling. Talk about the different lenses that Nikon has available for the Nikon One system. The, the kit lens that you probably got is probably the 10 to 30, and it's a great all-around lens. It's compact, it takes good pictures. If you want to get more reach out of it, if you want to be able to take pictures of farther away subjects, but you don't feel like changing the lens, check out one of the 10 to 100 lenses. This is the one I recommend for people shooting stills. You can pick it up at the, the URL here, and it does a good job, and it means you don't have to change your lenses. You're prepared for anything. It's bigger, though. You won't be able to quite so easily fit it into your cargo pants, but it'll still fit into a purse or messenger bag just fine. If you're shooting video, Nikon has a separate one 10 to 100 zoom lens, like a super zoom lens, but it has power zoom. The power zoom means you can be able to zoom in nice and smoothly. It's, it's a couple of hundred dollars more, so you'll only choose it over the previous lens if you're really serious about getting good video. If you want your camera to be even more compact, you should pick up the pancake lens. It will just make, make it smaller. It's not a zoom lens, though. It's a fixed wide-angle lens. It's going to be a, very much like your smartphone. But if what you're looking for is good image quality and small, lightweight, pick up this 10 millimeter f2.8 lens. If your lens is not wide angle enough, if you find that you can't back up far enough, if you're going into a European city with really narrow streets, or you're going to Yosemite or a national park with really grand vistas, you'll want a super wide angle lens. And, and Nikon has one. It's the 6.7 to 13 millimeter lens. You can pick it up at that link there. If you're getting into portrait work. They have an, a fairly inexpensive lens. It's also a great just walking around lens. It's perfect for street photography. The 18.5 millimeter lens is a good value and it will work fantastically in low light because it gathers far, far, far more light. So it will give you much cleaner images even in dim environments. If you're shooting things like basketball or other indoor sorts, that would be an inexpensive upgrade. If you get more serious about portraits and you want to really blur the background, 
Nikon has a 32mm f1.2 lens that will do a great job of blurring the background. I have to warn you though that it's, it's like $1,000. It's very expensive. So I, I want to provide a less expensive alternative for you here that might just blow your mind. I'm going to suggest buying a completely different camera with a lens. Instead of $900, this setup will, will cost you like $600 and change. So it'll save you about $250 if you get the, um, the Canon T5 and the Canon 85mm f1.8. That combination at the links that you can see there will give you more background blur. It'll probably focus a little bit better for you too, and you'll have a whole other camera. So it'll actually be a, a portrait setup that I think will work better, and it will save you money. The downside is you'll have to familiarize yourself with a second camera, but you might be happier with the results. You, if, if you just want to continue to use your one camera and you don't mind just changing out the one lens, go ahead and pick up that Nikon 32. It's, it's a fantastic lens. It's just I wanted to provide a less expensive alternative. If you're going to be making prints at home, um, there are online print services that produce far better results than trying to print at yourself. And we did a review of a bunch of different print services in the U.S. You can check the, out the video at stp.io slash printit. Those are U.S. only. So if you're outside the U.S., I'm sorry. I don't have recommendations. But check it out for free. And for things like selfies, knife photography, and even better quality landscapes, you might consider a tripod. This is the tripod I recommend everybody start with. It's a Dolica tripod. It's only 50 bucks. You can pick it up at this link here. It has a little hook on the bottom so you can hang your bag from it and, and really steady that tripod so it behaves like a much heavier tripod. This camera does not have a flash hot shoe, but you can use an external flash that has what we call an optical slave. You can put a flash like this on a table in another part of the room and it will wait until you take a picture with your flash and then it will fire and light up the whole room. And especially if you're, you're taking pictures in a big room, this can dramatically improve the image quality. And they cost only about 30 bucks. So it'll take a little bit of figuring out to get the, the two flashes to talk. Um, but if you're willing to put the time in to get it working, you can, you can really improve things like event photography at a wedding or pictures at a party in your house. Uh, pick it up at this link here, sdp.io slash tt560. And last but not least, the single greatest investment you can make is in improving your skills. Our channel is a great way to do that. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel for free. And we put out three new videos every week that will help you with your photography. Now, if you're just joining us now, we have about 400 existing videos. So go back to our channel, check out our best of videos, dig in to find out all the detailed information you need about photography. But if you want a more structured way of learning photography, if your time is valuable and you want to learn it quickly, check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography, out there on the left. It's the best-selling and highest-rated photography book ever. You can pick it up at Amazon by searching for my name, Tony Northrup, or you can visit the link here to buy it directly from us at sdp.io slash store. For an ebooks, it's under 10 bucks with over 12 hours of video. The paperback book provides links to those same videos, and it costs about 20 bucks, and the, the paperback is actually really nice to dig through. I hope this help, helped. Uh, if, if you want to say thank you for blowing out your voice in this long video, Give me a like and share that link, sdp.io slash tutorials with your friend. Also, subscribe to be sure to see more free videos. Thanks so much and enjoy your camera.